Today we're going to be setting up a brand new Raspberry Pi 5 from a kit. I'll put the technical specifications for the board in the description, but in short, with this version, we get a processor that is about two to three times faster than the Pi 4, improved graphics, improved connectivity, and some additional ports. If you're new to these entirely, Raspberry Pis are a very affordable computer that can be used for everything from learning to code and robotics to home automation and other hardware projects. Since the release of this version in late 2023, there have been lots of third-party accessories and kits hit the market. And in this video, I'll provide a walkthrough on how to assemble a typical kit like this one, including the steps needed to get it up and running with your operating system of choice. In this kit, I received the main Raspberry Pi 5 board. This one has 8GB of RAM, a fan cooler and heatsink. These can vary a little in appearance depending on the kit, but they all do the same thing. A SanDisk 128GB SD card, which is where we'll be installing the operating system. A SD card reader for connecting the SD card by USB if needed. HDMI cables for connecting a display. A USB Type-C power supply cable. And finally, a plastic case. If you're going to be doing any intensive CPU operations with your Pi, it can get quite hot without proper cooling, and this can result in something called thermal throttling, which is where the Pi essentially slows down the CPU to prevent overheating. One cooling option is to place individual heat sinks on each of the main chips that are most at risk of overheating. I demonstrated that process in another video with the Pi 4 board. Some kits may still come with those individual heat sinks, but Many now come with what they call an active cooler, which is basically a fan which provides the active cooling combined with a large heatsink that provides passive cooling. This is a good option, especially if you're putting the Pi 5 inside a plastic case. If your kit has individual heatsinks, I'd suggest watching my other video on how to install those. But basically, the larger heatsink goes on the CPU and RAM chips, and a smaller one is placed on the USB controller. Sometimes a fourth is even placed on the Ethernet controller chip. In this case, we'll be placing one large heatsink across the board and using the supplied thermal adhesive pads, which are placed between the main chips at risk of overheating and the heatsink itself. Simply peel off the plastic protective layer from the thermal pads and press them down firmly onto their corresponding chips. The larger one on the main CPU, the similar but slightly smaller one on the RAM chip, and the smallest one on the input-output controller. Sometimes these active coolers are mounted to the board with screws, while others use clips like this one. Either way, we need to make sure it's mounted firmly so that it can't move around once it's inside the case and being used. I'm placing the two clips through the holes of the heatsink and pressing them firmly down into the corresponding holes in the main board. This secures it firmly in place. We also need to connect the power cable for the fan and we may need to remove a small protective plastic tab before we can actually make that connection. We can then mount the board inside the supplied case using the screws from the kit. This is optional and may be unnecessary depending on how and where you plan to use the Raspberry Pi.
For power, we need a USB-C cable capable of delivering at least 5 volts and 3 amps. Again, I'm using the cable supplied with the kit and we just need to connect it to the power input on the board. Before we boot this up though, don't forget we still need to place an image of whatever operating system you'll be using on the micro SD card. An easy way to get started here is to hop over to raspberrypi.com and go to the software section. Here we can download their Raspberry Pi Imager software. They have versions available for Mac OS, Windows, and Ubuntu. And once downloaded, we'll need to install and run that Imager software. You'll be presented with this simple interface where we first need to select the applicable device, so Raspberry Pi 5 in this case, and then we select the operating system. For this demonstration, I'll be installing the standard Raspberry Pi OS, which is a port of Debian, but there are other options available, including Ubuntu. And finally, we need to tell it where to install the OS. So here we will point it towards the micro SD card. One final option before it begins is to apply some OS customization settings. Here, I'd recommend you click on edit settings and you'll be presented with this screen where you can assign a name to the device, set a username and password, configure the wireless connection and configure some basic time zone and keyboard settings. After you've provided that information, we can click save and give it final permission to write to the card. I'll skip ahead here as the process takes about five minutes. Once complete, we can make sure the SD card has been ejected, remove the card and then insert that into the SD card slot on the bottom of the Pi 5 board. Make sure you have your keyboard and mouse connected to the USB ports and connect a display to the micro HDMI port. We can then power it up. And again, I'll skip ahead a little just because the first boot of the OS takes a little bit longer during the first startup. But as you can see, that's really it in a nutshell. Your Raspberry Pi 5 is now set up with active and passive cooling. It's protected within a plastic case and boots to your chosen operating system. I hope that some of you find this video helpful, but that's it for this one. Thanks for watching.